worry, the Atari 50th Anniversary Collection releases soon, and that contains Fight for Life. Well, I uh, walked into that one, didn't I? I initially thought that that Atari collection was coming out much later, so I, I mean, I said it in a video, so it's finally time to talk about the Jaguar's killer app, its savior, the last official game Atari themselves ever published for their ill-fated jungle cat. This is the Jag's answer to Virtua Fighter Tekken and Battle Arena Toshinden. This is Fight for Life, and is one of the most disastrous and forgotten fighting games ever made, so it was always destined to enter our arena. Now, the Jag actually had a decent stable of fighters. Well, yeah, a decent. I, I mean, the quantity was surprisingly high, not, not, not the quality, but the common thread between all of them was that they all rigidly stuck to two dimensions, which was weird, because the Jag was a beastly 64-bit bleeding-edge powerhouse. I mean, wasn't it? Well, all that changed in early 1996, I didn't even realize Realize Jag games are still coming out then with Fight for Life, which, as noted by many, was one of the biggest stinkers in the Jaguar's litter pan. That, I mean, game library. But we don't really know for sure if it's worst fighting game material, although the chances are pretty good, until we get Fight for Life in the Ring. The development history of this JAG exclusive is wild, I can tell you that for free, and it all begins with a man by the name of François-Yves Bertrand. He has the distinction of being one of the very first foreign staff members ever hired by Sega's legendary AM2 arcade division, which was headed up by Yu Suzuki. This means Bertrand was on the original Virtua Fighter development team, and specifically worked on its camera and collision systems. So yeah, regardless of Fight for Life's reputation, not everyone can say I helped create Virtua fucking Fighter. So hats off to you, Mr. Bertrand. Any Anyway, after his stint at Sega, he moved on to 3DO for some reason, before finally landing at the Atari Corporation in May of 1994, where he and a small team were hired to head up a new fighting game project, with Bertrand acting as the sole programmer and designer. Atari saw the exploding popularity of 3D fighters and felt that the Jag needed its own. Supporting Bertrand's team was High Voltage Software, the developers of another Atari exclusive, White boys cannot perform the big jumpies, and would later create the conduit, and of course, Tournament of Legends! Their contributions would be relegated solely to artwork, although they have been sometimes miscredited as the main developer of Fight for Life, which is not accurate. To bring the polygonal punching to life, another company was chosen to supply the cutting-edge technology known as motion capture. Said company was BioVision, an umbrella subsidiary, who provided the game with over 250 unique animations. The team obviously had an uphill battle coming to grips with the Jags, uh, unique architecture, and how to squeeze out every ounce of polygon pushing power from it, which admittedly wasn't a lot. What really exacerbated the problem was the conga line of producers Atari assigned to oversee the project, as one Bill Raybach, who wound up getting the final credit, was not the first, <laughs> not by a long shot. The original producer who was first assigned to Fight for Life, who remains nameless to this day, seemed to be a bit of a charlatan, pouring milk and honey into the ears of Atari execs, masking them from the realities and true scope of the project. He told them, everything they wanted to hear, that Fight for Life was going to have more moves than Tekken, and twice as many dimensions as Battle Arena Toshinden, despite the fact that Bertrand and his team really weren't aiming for such lofty heights. The Jaguar was a weird thing, cobbled together with multiple components from different sources, rushed out the door, and relied more on its marketing campaign to get by, rather than the actual power of the console. While Bertrand was quoted as saying he liked mapping out the ins and outs of the machine, the results really speak for themselves. It was a marginal jump forward from even 16-bit hardware, and struggled to render polygons at acceptable frame rates. All throughout the development, things got increasingly worse, at least on the business side. That original unnamed producer just up and left the company, so a new, 
also unnamed producer, was brought in to inherit the project, and they are unnamed for a completely different reason. After working on Fight for Life for a Spell, they simply didn't want to be credited and asked for their name to be withheld. Jesus. So, so all told, four producers went in and out of the revolving door of the game's year and a half long development cycle, which, by the way, was a really, really long time in the mid-90s for a fighting game project. Fight for Life was shown off publicly as early as possible, including the Jaguar's initial Do the Math launch campaign, and was set to release sometime in December of 1994 and early 1995 at the very latest. This then slipped to the summer, which then slipped again all the way to December of 96. During these long delays, things were imploding off screen for Atari. The Jag just wasn't selling, it was getting routinely outclassed by the libraries of both the Saturn and the PlayStation. Atari was a sinking ship, but Bertrand and his team were still playing the music, trying to finish the game while receiving little support and communication from the higher-ups. This lack of communication resulted in a catastrophic blunder, one that is probably responsible for why Fight for Life is even remotely remembered today. Preview cards were shipped out to various publications like Next Generation Magazine a few months before the game was complete, but the Atari marketing department, which to be fair at this point was probably made up of like one janitor, mislabeled these cards with a sticker that said for review only instead of the intended sticker for preview only. But before this problem was caught, reviews already went out and whew, many of them pulled no punches. While rumors exist of a 100% complete version of Fight for Life, Bertrand has stated that this is not the case. Since Atari were in the process of shutting down by late 1995, their doors literally in mid-swing before they would finally close, the team were scrambling to finish the last few features, which just needed a bit more polish and implementation. With the 11th hour dawning quickly, it was decided to simply strip those features out of the game to make that deadline. Line. So, what was shipped can be considered an unfinished build. Fortunately, by 1996, not many in the press were even looking in the Jaguar's general direction, and while a number of Fight for Life's reviews were indeed pretty savage, it mostly faded into obscurity. Bertrand, for his part, summarized the whole affair pretty succinctly. At the time, Atari was not in good shape. From a financial point of view, the company was struggling. From a technical point of view, the Jaguar was outdated before developers could really get a hang of it. From the press point of view, well, Atari wasn't really the cat they were betting on. From a distribution point of view, the Jaguar never really made it, so Atari wasn't really the best place to be. And sure, Fight for Life wasn't a Virtua Fighter or a Tekken, but then the Jaguar wasn't a PlayStation either. And for those gamers who did invest their money in a system which was less than perfect, I know most were happy that some developers were spending time trying to do what they could. Oof, so, with all that said, uh... Look, it, it's the Jaguar, so I don't I, I don't really know what I'm supposed to say to you. Oh wait, I know what to say. This fucking incredible music video slash opening intro. That's, that's probably one of the weirdest, most charming things I've seen in a fighting game in like at least a week or two. Anyway, despite being texture mapped, it goes without saying that Fight for Life is uglier than Virtua Fighter 1. Hell, it's uglier than a lot of things, actually. And while visually it makes for a poor first impression, you eventually start to realize that, hey, this looks pretty half decent for being on the Jaguar. I have to admit though, I suffered through some world ending whiplash when I realized that Fight for Life came out the same year as Virtua Fighter 3. Just look at the. Just, yeah. 
It really reminds me of what FX Fighter would have looked like if that had released on the Super Nintendo. Oh, holy shit, as an aside, I was such an FX chip fanboy back in the day that I couldn't wait to play FX Fighter and was so crushed when it was moved over to the PC and was also terrible. But yeah, you get the sense here that the Jag is trying its absolute best, but paired with the blocky low-poly graphics, there's this odd American comic book style in the artwork, which I chalk up to High Voltage's involvement. And semi-related to that, I really can't just handle the character life bar names, as they just use the old Boo! Haunted House font. Like, why, why not pick something more thematically appropriate? Okay, so now let's move on to the roster, cause it's a... Uh, it's a weird one. We have Kimura, Mr. G, Ian, Lun, Kara, Muhali, Jenny, and, uh, Pog. Yeah, there, that's better. Now, why have all these weirdos gathered together? Well, in a very, very overt nod to another Sega fighter, Eternal Champions, Fight for Life rips off Eternal Champions. Each combatant has befallen a specific and horrible death, and now their souls are held in a realm called the fucking... <laughs> Specter Zone by someone or something called the Gatekeeper, who I can only assume has an unkempt beard and dislikes it when anything changes. If one of these sorry souls then wins a fighting tournament and beats said Keeper of Gates, they'll be resurrected and their life on Earth restored. Hence, of course, fight for life. This is again one of those backstories that's relegated to just the manual, but thankfully it's at least somewhat hinted at by the endings. You don't actually seem to fight the gatekeeper though, but his son, who's named J Junior? I. Th th this then results in Gatekeeper Senior, I guess, cutting a promo on you. Sometimes he lets the winning fighter win, and other times not. I, I don't know why. These endings are kind of brief and kind of shitty, but at least there's something. I'm looking at you, Rise of the Robots! Also, big ups to the dumb monster voice who handles all the announcing duties. Round one. <laughs> I swear, it sounds exactly like the guy from Spawn in the Demon's Hand. Speaking of voice samples, uh, the game actually has voice samples, which is sort of surprising for some reason. I'm so pretty. While they're cheesy, I think they're also a welcome inclusion, and the same goes for the music. The OST sounds like a dozen other SNES and Genesis games, so while it's not amazing by any stretch, it's not too bad either. All in all, I was expecting much worse in terms of presentation, but I guess that's helped out by the fact that I'm playing it on the recent Atari 50th Anniversary Collection, which, while containing dozens and dozens of arcade classics, also comes stocked with a selection of JAG classics. Now, what this does is present Fight for Life in the best possible light for this review. I can use a normal controller and, uh, you know, not, not this fucking thing, but what's even better is that this digital version actually works. Yeah, I have a hard copy of Fight for Life, I don't remember why, but it never actually worked properly. I tried cleaning the connectors, I, you know, tried being polite to the cartridge, but after a few minutes, it would always crap out on me. So, I imagine if I was playing this on real hardware, I would be way more angry by this point in the video, but don't worry, because we're now going to talk about the- Fight for Life is, uh, quite poor when you first start pushing buttons. The pace is, uh, really, really slow and the mechanics quite basic. Now, this wouldn't be much of a problem if it had come out in, say, 1992 or even 93, but remember, this is 1996. You have a punch, a kick, and a kind of weird evade defensive button, which sounds a bit like Virtual Fighter, but unlike VF, you do have dedicated dodge buttons to the left and to the right. You also have the same low gravity space jumps and real martial arts based special moves. Flip kicks, headbutts, and lunging sweeps, which is honestly a little bit disappointing. You're a bunch of weird zombie fighters who are bopping each other in hell, or the spector zone, whatever you call it, and all you got is a standard repertoire of moves. No fireballs or summoning skeletons, teleports, nothing you'd expect given the scenario you've been presented with. 
also, there's not a lot of info out there on how to actually play the game unless you get the Atari collection. The only FAQ out there is this unfinished one that literally just lists the fighters and nothing else. Like, who wrote this? W wait Chris Christian Svensson? Like, former senior vice president of Capcom USA? Christian Svensson? The, the guy I shared some drinks with on a rooftop pool in Miami ages ago? Damn, he was a massive Jaguar mark. Who knew? The real problem is, of course, the pace of the fighting. Damage is way, way too low across the board, which is in stark contrast to Virtua Fighter, whose damage has always been buck fucking wild. Fight for Life is the exact opposite, with most attacks only taking away a fraction of a fraction of health. This then leads to most encounters playing out like this. So after you've played two to three matches, you're going to have the sudden urge to just turn the poor Jaguar off and throw it through the window of your local Goodwill. But then, a funny thing starts to happen. The game slowly starts to open up. See, when you start an arcade run, your selection of special moves is almost nil, but once you've beaten an opponent, you're given the choice of stealing two of theirs to add to your, I don't know, combat mind chip. Now I your power. And this isn't limited to like four slots, by the way, where you gotta keep swapping special moves in and out. No, you start gaining a goddamn arsenal, and once you've KO'd half the roster, you start getting pretty damn powerful. These moves aren't difficult to use either, as it's mostly just double taps, and shockingly, they're all semi-responsive. Once you start utilizing those and the canned combo strings, guess what? You start dealing out plenty of damage, so it smooths out that pacing issue fairly considerably. Yeah, the AI tends to back off and run away a lot, dragging the fights out as you try to chase them down to do said damage, but at least the actual tools are there. The only other element about the gameplay is the ring out, well, the ring ends, as it were. Once you get near the edge of the arena, which is rare because the AI's spatial awareness is always on point, you run the risk of being knocked into this invisible electrical current which basically one-shots you. The winning character then just goes into their victory animation while the loser just fries away in complete and utter agony. I don't know why they just didn't go with a standard ring out, but you do you, Fight for Life. Let's move on to modes, which are again surprisingly in-depth. You have beginner mode, which lets you battle through the roster with a bigger selection of special moves straight off the bat, with the only catch being the inability to fight the final boss and get an ending. I suppose its function is to get players ready to the combat feel, at any rate. Tournament mode is where you really need to fight for your life as you start off much weaker, and is therefore more of a slog. Practice mode is kinda shitty because you have to play it with a second player in lieu of what you'd expect, which would be to beat up on an AI dummy. However, both players are actually given the full roster of special moves for each character, so that's cool, and the complete opposite of how brutal Pause of Fury handles it, which if you remember, is poorly. Strangely, there is also a separate versus mode, which takes away all the special moves. Uh, okay. Wow, so yeah, I went in expecting something unplayable when it comes to mechanics, but I guess if you have a game programmed and designed by someone who worked on Virtua Fighter, then it can't be that grim. Fight for Life is just held back by being not on the PlayStation. Yeah, it would have been nice if there were a few other unique combat options that could have set it apart even even further, but given the time, budget, and the Jaguar, I'm not sure what else they could have done. Oh wait, they should have made Fight for Life Ball Mode, where you bounce around, you know, the, the, the Jaguar Cube. Uh, wait, what? This is okay too? Yeah, well, it feels like a shittier, slower virtual fighter, as I've already discussed. It's not nearly as fluid or as fast, but the way the fighters shuffle as they move forward and back, the way punch-punch-kick combos connect, the jumps, even the throws, feel somewhat similar. If it's the early to mid-90s, emulating Virtua Fighter's basic feel is a safe bet. This means the credit, of course, has to go to Bertrand because if someone else had been put into 
his role, who knows what could have happened. As it is, the game feel of Fight for Life is not great, but acceptable, I suppose. Wait, am I high right now? What's going on? Listen, uh, nothing about Fight for Life is good, like at all, although I really enjoyed that announcer. <laughs> But considering the hardware, the tiny development team, and the mismanagement by the Atari higher-ups, it's not the giant embarrassing shit bomb I was expecting. If this had released on, say, the Super Nintendo, it probably would have been seen as some technological milestone worthy of praise. But on the Jaguar, it's just your run-of-the-mill bad game. No more, no less. So honestly, and I can't believe I'm saying this, Fight for Life has, against all odds, space jumped into the fairly stinky tier, which isn't high praise of course, but it's high for this show. So with that, we come to the end of another epic episode, and if you'd like to call me crazy for my tier placement, or like to suggest another combative contender to throw into our ring, do let me know in the comments below, or drop a line over on my Twitter, if that's still a functioning website by the time you see this video. So until then, Wandering Warriors, I'll see you next time on The Worst Fighting Games.